Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Welcome. So modernizing mainframe is a hot topic these days. There is a lot happening. We see great momentum from our customers, and there are great new capabilities available to them. Now, we know that there is no one-size-fits-all for modernizing mainframe application. But there is one pattern that consistently delivers great business benefits to our customers. And that pattern is replatforming. And that's especially true with MacroFocus and AWS. Not only it provides value in the short term with the migration and modernization project, but it also facilitates future modernization so that you get even more value in the longer term. And so that's what we want to talk about in this session today. Talk about the value that you get from the beginning to the future. And the best way to do this is with a real life project and a real customer example. And so it's my honor today to introduce Neil Data from NASA Financial Group. Neil Data is a chief information officer from NASA Financial Group. And Neil will share with us the cloud modernization journey that his company is going through and the read platforming project benefit that he's getting and some of the details about this project. Before we hear from Neil Data, I'm actually also very pleased to introduce our great partner, Neil Fowler from MicroFocus. Neil Fowler is the general manager of the application modernization and connectivity group from MicroFocus. And Neil will share with us the approach and the value that you get with MicroFocus and AWS. For the third segment of this session today, I will showcase to you some technical highlights about the AWS mainframe modernization service. My name is Phil DeValens, and I'm the product manager for the AWS mainframe modernization service. All right, so let's jump right in. I'm going to hand over to Neil Fowler. Well, thanks for that, Phil. And add my welcome to everybody here today as well. So as Phil said, what I'm going to do to start with is try to give you a bit of an introduction to the MicroFocus offering and how that can add business value to customers who want to go through this approach. So where we see most enterprises starting from is where they have core enterprise applications that may be started on a mainframe system. Those systems are run reliably, consistently, and delivered value for many years. But over time, the complexity of the environment in which these enterprise applications continue to work has grown, whether that be from client server into uh, private and public cloud, integration, integrating with SaaS solutions. But all of these things are in addition to, so they are and, not or. So increasing the complexity, the attack surface, and all of the things that you have to manage in terms of the whole environment which your application is beginning to uh, exist within. And as part of that, you also need to understand that that complexity is potentially slowing you down and limiting your ability to leverage the great innovation that's happening into some of the other, other platforms that we see. So when we actually speak to our customers and we ask them what they mean and understand by modernization, here's just a, some of the examples that we get in terms of answers. Well, the key thing around this one is they're all right because they're all around the business challenges that they're trying to achieve, trying to make sure that they can deliver all of the things you see on this screen from, from starting with DevOps to be able to embrace cloud, to be able to extend and modernize those applications from as part of a digital transformation strategy. But when you look at it, you know, this can be quite overwhelming in terms of all the different things which actually form or could form part of a modernization journey. But when you're looking at it and you start thinking about it in terms of the lenses of application, process, and infrastructure modernization, it allows you to then narrow that down into something much more achievable. So I think as, as Phil started off by saying, the, the approach that you take for these modernization journeys isn't a one size fits all. You really need to understand what you're trying to achieve. So with, with a complex application portfolio, for each application in that portfolio, you need to understand and, and discover what your, both your business and your technical drivers are. What are you trying to achieve from a journey like this? Is it to solve issues regarding the operational risk of being able to maintain this platform into the future? 
Are you losing competitive advantage because the time to market, to be able to deliver solutions to the customers as part of the digital strategy, it's slowing you down because you aren't necessarily as efficient or as optimized as you can be. With that enhanced com complexity of the enterprise landscape, you've got multiple technologies, different platforms, different skills, different development tools. You need to be able to simplify that to be able to get the strategic alignment and be able to deliver solutions more quickly. And you couple that with the technical concerns, whether that be uh, the technical debt, concerns about availability or the cost price performance that you're trying to get through. Well, as you understand each one of your applications goes through of what you're trying to achieve, then you understand what's necessary, and then you can apply one of the standard patterns, the six R's as they're known on the right-hand side here. So if it's an application that has no value, providing little uh, uh, value to your business, you may choose to retire it. If it's a standard uh, application that doesn't actually represent any intellectual property or value add, you might want to replace it with a, a standard off-the-shelf package. But more often, we see these core applications that encapsulate the business value that have been driving the business for years. And as part of that, you might then want to look at maybe even retaining. If it might be happy running it in place, keeping it where they are. But to be able to deliver on those business and technical requirements, you might need to adopt different practices, maybe a DevOps solution, maybe to be able to improve the, the code quality and be able to move that application forward to extend it with APIs. What we're also seeing more frequently, and especially as, you know, as we're seeing here from our, our friends here at AWS, is a lot more customers looking to evaluate infrastructure modernization and moving those applications into new environments, replatforming to different systems. Well, then you've got different choices. Do you replatform, maintaining as much as you've got, or do you actually take an approach of maybe starting from scratch and rewriting the application? Well, there's different challenges with each of those approaches. What we've seen based on our experience and as analysts write about this one, is everything you try to do around this is a balance of cost, risk, and speed. Major projects that you're trying to rewrite or transform systems are very high risk, have a high chance of failure. As the, as, the, as the statistics, as you see here, uh, represent. But what we also see is the reverse is true. If you start with what you've got and then incrementally modernize, far higher chance of success and far higher chance of being able to deliver against those business drivers that you identified in the first stage of this process. So how big is this challenge? Well, it's a challenge and an opportunity. So Microfocus worked with Vance and Bourne to be able to do a survey of finding out how many lines of code there are still in existence. The number even surprised us. It was much bigger than with the previous estimates. But as part of that survey, we also, Vance and Bourne working with them, actually asked customers what their intentions were for their applications, and how core cool these applications were to them. And as you see some of the results here regarding how many of those applications still remain strategic to the operation, as in it's not necessarily suitable for replacement, or by repurchasing the package. And actually, even in the situation of the COBOL usage expanding over time, being able to embrace and adopt cloud strategies. So we, what we see from actually talking to all of our, our customers and beyond is actually the intent of systems and how to take them forward into the future. Well, this is where Microfocus, uh, several years ago, introduced the modernization maturity model. So this looks fairly simplistic at the outset, but it really encapsulates the decades of experience we have based on thousands of successful projects. And as I mentioned before, the application, the process, and infrastructure modernization remain key parts around this. Coupled with that, you also have the management and culture aspects, which I'll get onto in a few moments. So if you're thinking about it, what you're trying to do is, after you've been through that business assessment, trying to understand what you're trying to achieve, you know, and you know your current as-is state, you know where you are, you can also then plot where you want to be. It does not mean one is bad and five is good. It doesn't mean getting everything to five is where you want to get to. It really needs to align with your business strategy and your choices. But as part of that, there's an interdependence between each of these layers, and that's what this is trying to represent. This is backed up by lots of best practices and years of experience of delivering successful outcomes. So if you took a strategy such as infrastructure modernization, this might be replatforming, taking it from their existing environment and deploying on the AWS cloud. 
Well, that application, as we know, we've proven time and time again, is absolutely viable to be able to move the application functionally into, into the cloud. But if you just move it, try to move it as is, without thinking and considering the application changes, how you may have originally architected the system for a platform, you really need to understand non-functionally what you might need to do from a performance, from a scale, and an operation standpoint. And as you continue that journey, you know, as you're looking to deploy maybe into taking the stages, maybe deploying the application in containers, well, then you need to consider things like infrastructure as code and automation. The way that you may have administered your original environment as a monolith is completely different how you might run it when you're taking advantage of cloud scale and dynamic deployment options. So as you go through these different pieces, you really need to understand what it is you're trying to achieve and the best practice of getting there and how you can take advantage of the platform as a service capabilities, which you are part of the cloud optimized solution. But as you'll also understand, you know, some of these changes are large scale changes within an organization. It really means cultural buy-in. People need to understand and go through that. But what we also see on the reverse end of this is, after people go through this journey, they really realize the benefits, both from a cultural aspect, from a productivity, and be able to deliver ongoing modernization, as, as, as Phil was referred to a few moments ago. So when someone goes through a journey like this, what, what are the outcomes? Well, we've been doing, as I said, we've been doing this for many years, for decades. And we've got so many customer examples and case studies which actually back up all of this. And you'll be able to hear from Neil in a moment with a, a few examples of a, a recent project that, that he's been through. But if you look at it, you know, based on those original requirements of understanding both the drivers from a business and a technical perspective, you can start to understand how you can realize the IT modernization be able to ensure that your applications are more agile, you can innovate more quickly, deliver value time to market much more quickly. That improves the efficiency and the productivity of the engineers, the operators, how quickly you can enter, deploy new applications or respond to regulatory changes to be able to deliver those into that new environment. But there's also additional benefits as well as part of that digital transformation strategy. That data is now available to be able to do data-driven analytics take advantage of AI and ML, and integrate that into your overall workflows. And all of these things together really help that modernization journey, because it really is, modernization is not a destination, it's a continuous journey. Being able to leverage the innovation that's available on the AWS platform, to be able to extend that into the future, to integrate all of those systems, to continue delivering value to your end customers. And what we also see as part of these benefits, which isn't necessarily always a primary driver, but there are lots of cost benefits that can be achieved as well. You'll hear some specifics, but what we see is quite often over 75% cost benefits in terms of actually starting this modernization journey, making it more effective, delivering better outcomes, and saving money at the same time. So rather than just hear me talk about the theory of it, I've got possibly the easiest handover from one Neil to the next. I don't even have to remember names, so I shall pass to the next Neil, so thank you. <laughs> I was going to start with something like from the British accent to the Indian accent, um, but Neil to Neil works too. Um, so a little bit about our company. Uh, Nassau Financial Group was founded in 2015, uh, but we call ourselves as a legacy company that goes back to 1851. Um, we have mainly grown through acquisitions, but we also have a lot of organic growth. A financial services company focused in insurance, um, reinsurance, and asset management. Overall, we have um, approximately 400,000 policyholders, um, and uh, in terms of asset management, we manage just shy of $20 billion of assets and a little over $7 billion of third-party asset management. <clears throat> uh, pride ourselves in best-in-class service, uh, as well as digital enablement of uh, insurance products and helping our customers. Um, in 2015, when we started, um, our, our infrastructure looked very different. Significant presence on-prem, including emails, some of the legacy technology right there. Um, and we had started thinking about how do we modernize this, where do we want to be in five to seven years. And as we were talking through that, a major project came about, and we view that as an accelerator to our cloud journey. Um, our actual models um, 
the demand from the actuaries was significantly increasing. Um, there were needs for about 200 million calculations on every job run, every scenario that they were playing. And our physical infrastructure, on-prem infrastructure, was just, as you can imagine, not keeping up with that. Um, that sort of triggered our exploration of how do we get into cloud? How can we do this with um, a cost-effective way, as well as what you hear, heard uh, Neil and Phil talk about, uh, business value. Um, and, and that was our sort of first stepping stone into AWS. Uh, significant progress was made, 80% uh, reduction in uh, run times for those 200 million calculations. Uh, all delivered without any capital expenses um, by a, a complete sort of um, uh, consumption only model, which was new for us. Uh, and we sort of got hooked onto it. Business saw the value in that. Um, we were able to redeploy resources to other projects. So in about uh, two years' time, uh, we moved into focusing on best-in-class service portals. So we run all of our serverless compute in AWS. These portals are enabled to give our customers access to their policy documents, uh, application statuses, um, various illustrations. All of this is run digitally, uh, enabling our customers to do it. Uh, through mobile phones, portals, and, and it's all serverless. Um, this was our first sort of uh, major milestone in saying 25% of our infrastructure has been moved to the cloud. Uh, next focus was sort of looking at the rest of the infrastructure, uh, security stack, um, SD-WAN deployment, and something to mention, when we started, we did not even have a, a direct connect. Uh, we established that. Uh, moved into uh, significant efficiencies, getting our data back and forth that way. Uh, that has evolved, and then something we again touched on uh, prior, incremental improvements and taking advantage as, as AWS evolves and releases new technologies, new services, now we are using transit gateways. So from no uh, direct connect to uh, transit gateway, that has been an uh, uh, evolution right within there. Uh, as that happened, uh, enterprise data warehouse, and most of our finance, actual, and corporate platforms are moved there, hitting sort of 50% of infrastructure by 2020. Uh, and, and that cloud journey was starting to become a very positive story within our enterprise. Uh, 2021 through 2025 was sort of focus on how can we become 100% cloud? I think 100% is a aspirational goal. I think we'll start achieving that and uh, striding towards it uh, starting next year. But focus is going to be converting majority of the mid-tier platforms uh, on our cloud platforms with AWS with help of MicroFocus. Um, by third quarter of next year, all of our mid-tier environment will be in cloud. Um, and then what remains is probably the most complex, and we've got sort of two footprints from when, when we talk about mainframe. We have some partners that we work with. We have their intellectual property applications, and then what we have is our own intellectual property. So obviously, having those uncharted te territories of how do we convert this, we have never done it, what to expect. We started with our intellectual property. TCS has been our uh, long-term partner. Uh, our relationship goes almost decades back. Uh, partnered with them, AWS and MicroFocus, to sort of come up with a business case to say, how can we create something that we can look at, um, sort of make it bite-size, and convert that into cloud, uh, get a feel for what this journey is going to look like, because we have three large admin systems that we want to convert. Some of them have a language assembler, probably written before even I was born. Uh, that has no direct way of converting. So I wanted to understand what AWS offers us, uh, what MicroFocus gives us, and leveraging TCS's capabilities in this area to sort of complete this journey. So our goal is, uh, by 2025, we are going to be approaching 100% uh, cloud presence uh, overall uh, across the enterprise architecture as well as infrastructure. So that's a good plug into today's focus. Uh, we label this as Project Plato. This was our first step towards converting a small set of uh, NASA-owned intellectual property software uh, focused on commission calculations and valuation system for some of our legacy systems. These are all running on mainframe with one of our other infrastructure providers, very standard on-prem presence for that. Significant CapEx, as you can imagine, 
imagine extremely high MIP rates and costs that we spend on this. So the idea is to convert that um, with the objective of reducing the risk to the business. I think something Neil touched on, what is the business value? It's easy to lead with, I want to simplify technology, I want to reduce um, my on-prem presence, but what is the value that business is gaining out of this? So the risk we were taking on was significant amount of resources uh, were spending their time on either uh, recovering from faults, uh, spending a lot of time on writing code and deploying it because DevOps is extremely difficult in, in our traditional environment. Um, and we were starting to lose some of these resources because finding resources who want to code in COBOL and mainframe environment is not necessarily uh, a sexy job anymore. And so we were having a lot of challenges losing those resources. TCS uh, works with us to keep those resources up and running, but uh, not always easy. Um, we had, as I mentioned, we started our journey in 2015, 2016. We had uh, a set of established cloud infrastructure. One of our, the goals that we set up for ourselves was how can we leverage as much of that infrastructure as possible, create repeatable templates, take advantage of security, DevOps, SecOps that we established there so that there are efficiencies that we build within that environment. So again, leveraging that was a key component for us. Um, integrations with existing platforms, as well as enabling business without creating a disruption for them. Uh, back to what is the business value here? Either don't impact them or give them more value and more in, uh, opportunity to do more with the data, with the systems that they have. So those are sort of the objectives we set for ourselves to make sure this is a true uh, business value. Overall project lasted about a year. Um, I'm gonna to touch on the timeline at a high level. We'll get into some of the details and lessons learned and approach taken, but I think key things to highlight, if you guys are taking on the journey, um, assessment and proof of concept, I think was epitome for us. The analyzer, Microsoft, uh, micro focus analyzer that was made available to us was foundational to saying what this project sizing is gonna look like. Where do we have to rewrite a piece of code versus where can we translate and transform that as is uh, was huge. Uh, so that time taken to analyze it, plan it, look for the right resources, do that was important. Um, migration, uh, there are some lessons to learn in migration. I think uh, getting our data from mainframe onto the cloud uh, was a challenge. We haven't solved that yet, but I'm gonna to touch on that again when we get to lessons learned there because we have uh, future pl uh, steps planned. Uh, overall integrations, these systems upstream and downstream have about half a dozen to dozen different interfaces coming in and out. So making sure those are tested, uh, those are still as uh, efficient. We have some SLAs to meet with our external partners. So making sure that's happening, testing that, performance testing of that. Um, Battle run, I think this was a key fundamental uh, uh, success story for us. We talk about paddle runs a lot, but our paddle run did identify some issues. So good news there was it did the job it was supposed to do and prevented uh, an issue going into production. At the same time, it allowed us to sort of look at, okay, what did, what did we miss in coding or testing or our overall conversion approach that we can bring in as we do the next phase of the project? Uh, and go live, happy to announce, uh, literally, the beginning of November, all of these systems are running in cloud. No production issues since, and meeting all the SLAs. Um, high level touch base on sort of technology mapping, not gonna go through line by line here, but uh, to give you a sense for from mainframe uh, to, to cloud, how we map those. Uh, most of them were one, on, one for one with microfocus. Couple of highlights uh, from a scheduler standpoint, we did switch from ESP to Stone Branch, which is a separate product, not MicroFocus. Uh, security and operating systems all were changed. But this mapping was another important exercise to understand what skills we are gonna need, uh, what sort of investment we'll have to make in training uh, and knowledge transfer. Um, overall architecture. Um, Sort of uh, the green boxes to the left, I think this is where the analyzer was key for us, uh, running through all the code, identifying uh, where the changes are, where the recompiles are needed. Uh, across, going uh, horizontally at the top, the uh, code commit uh, and, and uh, 
that DevOps uh, that we have, we continue to use that from our baseline. Um, significant uh, investments were made in uh, SecOps, where CloudWatch and CloudTrail have been used. Those sort of feed into our overall enterprise SecOps architecture. So that was another piece we wanted to make sure it's all tied into it. I was at a session earlier today uh, with uh, CIOs and CISOs talking about uh, what's the importance and how do you make sure security is part of your uh, culture. And culture, I think, is at two parts, organizational culture and your design culture. So I think this was a good parallel that I found from that. So we did shift that left, made sure it was part of our uh, overall solution. Um, on the right, I think you'll see a couple of pieces where we have used uh, integration with our enterprise data warehouse. This was another journey that we took on 2017-2019 uh, timeframe. So this, this integration with our enterprise data warehouse that runs in AWS environment uh, is another success story. A couple of lessons learned there and, and good outcome there. We'll touch on that as, as we talk about some metrics later on. Um, and then overall uh, platform was uh, still our overall, <clears throat> overall uh, AWS organizational structure and account structure. So when we started the journey, we didn't necessarily have specific goals because we didn't know what was our target that we wanted to hit. That was one of the objectives of the project to say, at this level, if what sort of efficiencies that can we get and then can we extrapolate those to our larger project for three admin systems that we're going to convert uh, starting next year. Um, overall, I think it was a good success story. It has given us great uh, uh, data points to sort of say, what are we going to do for a new phase? So when you talk about data ingestion and data processing, uh, our improvements are in 75% range. This includes from running any batch as well as any transactional data to its interfaces and then into uh, any of our presentation layers or reporting layers. This is huge because any of our uh, account closing processes that these systems feed into has, has made it really easy and, and efficient for those processes. Alt recovery, 50%. Uh, this was huge because every time there's an outage related to a ABIND or anything else of that sort, significant amount of resources are expended in recovering from that. So 50% is a great, great uh, outcome there. Um, business SRs or enhancements that we get, uh, approximately 35% improvement. So between the resource savings in uh, fault recovery as well as turnaround time for an SR that we work on, we are able to give back uh, our business tremendous value. Resources are now gonna, now gonna use that time that has been saved to work on more value-added work. So this is a, a very important uh, business outcome, extreme importance on those, because now these resources are not only working towards a business uh, value-related project, but now they have more creative and interesting work and, and generates a lot of retention for us. Lastly, I think everyone's always focused on the cost. So far, we have uh, estimated 30% reduction. Now, this will sound slightly lower than what Neil was talking about earlier. However, this is before we have decommissioned any hardware. So these are just based on what were our run rates on mainframe versus what's our run rate on AWS. I think as we get through the three admin system conversions, we are anticipating this to go into the 70%, 75% range that Neil was talking about. So that they, significant amount of savings. These are dollars that we are able to either reinvest in other innovation or improve. Can you guys hear me? There we go. Uh, as well as um, giving it back to the enterprise so that we can, as a company, redeploy these resources elsewhere. Lessons learned. I think uh, the first bullet sounds very common and, and um, uh, it sounds like, well, geez, isn't that always the case? But I think the key thing what we noticed here is the top-down executive uh, commitment. It was not only at NASA, but also AWS, TCS, as well as MicroFocus, because we did hit uh, bumps, which all transformational projects do. And at that point, there was a really coordinated effort by all levels to make sure those bumps were not getting in our way as well as making sure internally we had the resources to go uh, sustain the project for a year 
it being viewed as a foundational piece for a long-term conversion that we're gonna take on over the next two years. Um, business value, I think I've touched on this multiple times. Uh, leading with business values, especially when you work in financial services company where IT is viewed as a cost center is extremely important. Um, we have taken away many lessons uh, from that. Uh, our business cases focus on business values tremendously. Um, communication, I think this is another one where it's, you feel as if it's normal we do communicate because a lot of status reports are pr produced. These are on dashboards. Where is the project green, red, yellow? However, talking about these in QBRs, talking about these at your CEO's uh, all hands uh, is important because it reminds the entire organization what are we doing, why are we doing, and where the organization go can go with it. So that has an extremely important aspect for us. We are taking those lessons and sort of applying it across other business cases that we are deploying. Um, and last but not the least, I think, um, Subject matter experts when it comes to technology or business processes was another important part we realized. Um, there are simple, trivial issues that you run into. When you look at it after the fact, you're always thinking, oh yeah, that's obvious. Uh, example, I think we ran into a Epsidic versus ASCII character conversion issue. We ran into a uh, Julian calendar versus other uh, uh, date-driven logic that was in the code, uh, sorting algorithms. So these are small pieces but how they tie in and quickly turning those around and not letting those become major project issues, you really need that subject matter expert. Very commonly we hear, well, coding and my, uh, uh, sort of technologists can be thought of commodity skills. That's a true statement. You should take advantage of that. However, how, to, how it applies to your business and your specific situation without those subject matter experts is hard. So, that's, that's a key thing for us to remember because we do have significant workforce who works on these legacy technologies. Either they're leaving because they're retiring or uh, they're leaving for better opportunities. I think all of us are uh, observing that in the marketplace. Uh, where do we go from here? <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, we have three large uh, admin systems. Uh, one of them is NASA's intellectual property. Other two are partners in intellectual property, so we're going to have to focus on understanding what challenges that brings. One of them uses Assembler significantly, so we will be focusing on that. <clears throat> um, DevOps, we have started it. Uh, I would say we're in infancy of it, but headed in the right direction, so how can we expand on that and actually make it a DevSecOps? Uh, that, that's a goal that we have across the enterprise, um, and this will be a good way to get that started. Uh, all the data is now available in the cloud, and so how can we get this um, available uh, for our business intelligence and analytics so better business decisions are uh, drawn from the, the, the value they get out of that? Um, and overall, what else can be done? I talked about we are a digitally enabled company. We have many portals. Example here is commission calculations. Our agents and IMOs who work for us, who sell our business, um, now this data is available in modern platform. Can we look at something like a status on their commission payments? What are the estimates? So on and so forth. So those opportunities are starting to open up. While no projects have been committed to that yet, but those are sort of digital rocks that we look at and kind of deliver incrementally. Something else Neil talked about, uh, that those opportunities are available now to us. Something that was very difficult to do before in the older technology. So with that, I'll turn it to Phil to bring us to closure. All right, thank you, Neil. Great experience, great projects. A real life example, right? That's uh, what we need to make it more real. So, um, as Neil was saying, I mean, he was just showcasing 35% improvement in turnaround time for uh, business function development. That's just amazing. And that's typically what we talk about when we talk about increasing agility, and that's important. So what I want to do now is actually provide you with some uh, highlights about the AWS mainframe realization service. We've made this service generally available back in June of 2022, so it's fairly recent. And why did we create that service? Well, the main reason is because we started listening to our customers and we found out that they need some help. And so we wanted to make it easier for them to do those modernization projects and make sure they can do them at scale. And for that, we've included in the service itself some proven tools, proven methodology, 
and we're lowering the bar in terms of skill level so that more people can do those modernization projects. All this is to better serve our customer drivers, increase the agility, reduce the cost, and mitigate the risk that customers do have with their mainframe applications. So this is an overview of the AWS mainframe modernization service. So essentially, it's a cloud-native platform to migrate, modernize, execute, and operate mainframe applications. So you can see the various stages that you can typically go through, and as Neil was presenting them, you've already seen them, some of them in detail. But essentially, the platform itself provides all the underlying tools and infrastructure so that you can go through those stages from the analysis phase, which is understanding all your mainframe application assets, understanding the dependencies, the complexities, doing your planning and assessing the difficulty of doing the, the transformation project, moving on to the transform stage, where you're actually gonna take your mainframe application assets and start adapting them. That could be data format adaptation, that could be code adaptation, rebuilding, recompiling your application. Moving on to the develop stage, where actually we'll provide an integrated development environment so that developers can actually make further enhancements to the application code. Moving on to the test, especially during a migration and modernization project, test is super important. We, make, we want to make sure that there is functional equivalence between source and target to be able to execute uh, the project quickly with maximum automation. And then the last stage here is deploy and operate. And that's quite different from some of the other AWS services. Oftentimes, AWS services for migration really focus on the migration stage itself. In this service, we go beyond that. Not only we provide the tools to do the migration itself, but we also provide the supporting infrastructure to execute and operate your application via a fully managed runtime environment. And I'll provide some details about what this means exactly. And for the replatform pattern, all this is supported by the MicroFocus Enterprise toolchain starting from Enterprise Analyzer, Enterprise Developer, the build tools, and Enterprise Server. So it, it supports multiple use cases. Of course, it supports the initial migration and modernization. It supports the execution and operation of your application, but it also supports further modernization, enhancements, whether you want to build innovation. The tool chain actually does far beyond just maintaining your application, operating your application, but also facilitating the modernization moving forward. Now, because this is a platform, we're actually uh, always thinking about how to improve that platform, add more capabilities so that the migration itself is more streamlined, so that there are more capabilities that are available for further modernization. At the end of the day, really, we want to make sure that it's an integrated um, modernization platform, which means that when customers engage in a modernization project, they can find most of the tools and the capabilities that they need to be successful with their project. So, the AWS mainframe modernization service supports the modernization journey. And as we were saying from the beginning, the journey is a continuous journey, which means that you're going to start with initial migration and modernization, but then you're going to continue start going through some improvements to better meet your business objectives. So, it starts with value in the short term, because with the service, you can actually um, benefit from cloud native services. And then it also continues with uh, innovation in the longer term that you can deploy. It all relies on evolutionary transformation. That means we're going to reuse investments that were made in the past in the application assets. We're not talking about a rip and replace approach here. And we do this so that we can accelerate the speed of the modernization and we can reduce the risk accordingly. So if we start from the left-hand side, you can see the mainframe monolith. And it has the typical challenges that we hear uh, that our customers have with mainframe applications. During the first phase, which is the migrate and modernize phase, we're going to modernize the infrastructure and the processes while trying to keep the uh, application changes minimal. So we're going to reduce the risk and we're going to accelerate the migration and modernization projects. During that first phase, what you can see is that there are numerous AWS cloud native services that can be used already. For example, for executing the application itself, the AWS mainframe modernization service provides a fully managed elastic runtime where your application can run. But immediately as well, you can actually also do your CI CD pipeline, implement DevOps best practices. So, for example, you can use code commit, code deploy, code pipeline, all this is already available and fully managed uh, by fully managed AWS services. Same thing for your data. 
whether you want to deploy your data in a relational data source, then you can use uh, a fully managed service such as Amazon Aurora, or you can use Amazon Relational Database Service, or the S. If you want to do infrastructure as code, you can do as well with CloudFormation. AWS Cloud provides also all the services that are necessary so that you can do sysops, all the system management of your, of your infrastructure. Now, once you're done with your short-term migration, which is actually a monetization in many ways, then you can move on to mid-term innovations. You can continue operating and optimizing your environment. And this is the second phase. And in this phase, then you can do a lot of things. It really opens a world of possibilities, starting from creating new APIs, to doing service extractions, to introducing new channels. For example, if you want to open your applications to a mobile, a mobile devices, creating web services, going into more granular services like microservices, all these becomes possible. And it actually matches pretty well the evolution that you can have from a monolith to more granular services. Typically, in the first phase, you would create what we call microservices. And then if you need to, even, to go to even more granular services, to microservices, you can do so as well with the tools that are provided by the platform. So what you can see here is that the AWS Mainframe Monetization Service provides you with capabilities so that you can, it can support your end-to-end -end monetization journey. This approach in two stages allows innovating sooner and minimizing the risks because the initial migration is quick and it's functionally equivalent. So let's get a little deeper into the AWS mainframeization service itself. As I was telling you before, it's an AWS cloud native service. And what do we mean by this? Because oftentimes when you hear about a fully managed service, it's hard to grasp exactly what we're talking about. If you're already familiar with other AWS services such as Amazon Relational Database or RDS or such as Elastic Beantalk, it's, we're talking about the same approach here. Basically, it's a born in the cloud, fully managed, automated infrastructure and middleware that's operated from the AWS console or from the AWS APIs or from the AWS command line interface. Now, just to be clear, it's not a managed service provider offering, which means that there is no staff behind the scene that's doing the work for, for you. It's a technical offering that we're talking about here. It doesn't mean that you cannot have a managed service provider that's actually using that service. But what we're providing from AWS here is really the technical offering, all the technical infrastructure with a lot of automation so that you can simplify how you manage and operate such an environment. So if you compare the level of responsibilities that you have between a mainframe or a deployment on infrastructure services such as Amazon EC2 or a cloud native service, then AWS is going to take more and more responsibilities so that we can make it easier for you to operate and manage certain environments. On the mainframe side, on the mainframe side typically, as a customer, you would have to manage the data center, you would have to manage the hardware, the cooling, the operating system, the middleware that runs on top of it, and you would have to configure all the highly available capabilities, scalability, or the monitoring. You need to have experts for managing the transaction subsystem, the database subsystems, and then you have to take care of the application and the data. When you start moving this to the cloud, for example, with infrastructure as a service and Amazon EC2, then with AWS Cloud, AWS is taking care of all the data center layer, the cooling, it's gonna take, take care of provisioning the hardware itself, and then from the operating system up, then you're gonna be responsible for maintaining the operating system, you're gonna be responsible for installing any middleware that you need for your application, and then on top of that, you need to configure scalability, you need to do the procurement of the resources, manage the installation, the patching, etc and manage the middleware, the databases, etc. So you still have a lot to do. When you move to cloud native services, then the cloud native service is actually going to provide you with a lot of capabilities and features to support you with all those middleware activities. So that, for example, the cloud native service is going to make it easier for you to configure high availability because all this is going to be automated by the service itself. It's going to make it easier to do all the monitoring and logging. If you need to procure the middleware, while well, the managed service is going to provide that middleware for you. You don't have to go to a, do a separate procurement or go through a separate licensing mechanism. It's all provided by the, by the managed service itself. So that really allows you to focus more on the application and data layer so that you don't have to worry and spend too much time on managing the underlying infrastructure. So all this is really to focus your time and energy on the application and the data as opposed to the undifferentiated heavy lifting of managing the underlying infrastructure. 
That allows reducing the expertise that's required to manage those environments. For example, you don't need to be a middleware expert to be able to manage that type of environment. If you already have familiarity with other AWS services, then you can easily adopt that service as well and start becoming comfortable to managing an application running on top of it. It also allows uploading some of the responsibility to a trusted platform such as AWS. Of course, it's going to free up some time and it's going to allow you to make some savings from productivity and additional agility. So this was more like the responsibility view of it. What I want to highlight as well is more a technical view of the cloud-native fully managed runtime that's provided by the AWS mainframe organization service. That's really one of the important reasons why customers adopt AWS Cloud, because there is a large choice of native fully managed services. And that really makes it easier to actually deploy and manage infrastructure. So if you look at the top, you can see that there is a fairly simple architecture. And why does it look so simple? It's because it's completely relying on fully managed services. If you look at the load balancer, it's elastic load balancing from, from AWS. It's a simple component, and all the underlying complexities of making it highly redundant, available, et cetera, is managed by AWS. When you deploy your application on the AWS mainframe organization service runtime, it's also going to be looking very simple. You're going to create one or a few instances, and then the managed service itself is going to take care of the underlying complexity. Same thing on the data side. With Amazon RDS for your relational database or for your file storage, it's going to be a very simple architecture. Now, let's dig into the built-in capabilities a, a little more, and that's what you see at, at the bottom here. You can see that for AWS cloud-native services, there are five key characteristics that are going to provide value to you. The first one is that those cloud-native services rely on cloud-native interfaces. They have built-in automation. They have managed resources. They benefit from cloud-native resiliency. And then they have native integrations. So let's dig a, a little bit into them. For the cloud-native interfaces, that means straight from the AWS Management Console, where you have all the AWS services, you can find the AWS Mainframe Resolution Service, and you can start an environment and deploy your application straight from there. If you want to do it from the AWS Command Line Interface, you can do it as well, or use the AWS APIs, or use CloudFormation. The second big component is around built-in automation. And so you can see that the managed service provides a lot of automation to make it easier to perform day-to-day -day task, operational task. For example, if you need to set up a highly available environment across multiple availability zones, then it's all going to be automated by the service itself. If you need to do uh, deployment of an application, if you need to do the scaling, uh, if you need to manage versioning of your application, etc., all, all of these are services that are being provided by the managed service itself. The managed service also contains managed resources. And when we say manage resources, for each of the services themselves, it's going to be slightly different. For the AWS mainframe organization service, those managed resources are compute. There, it, it includes also middleware. It includes all the locking mechanisms, all the underlying caching. And because we're dealing with mainframe applications, it also includes transactions, batch jobs, data sets, or even queues. And all this becomes managed resources, which you can straight you can access directly from the uh, AWS mainframe, uh, sorry, AWS management console and manage directly from there. The fourth component that's important with a cloud native service is the cloud native resiliency. It's very important for mainframe applications. Uh, mainframe applications typically have stringent non functional requirements. And so we make sure that the service itself is designed to meet or exceed the non-functional requirements that your mainframe applications could have in terms of high availability, elasticity, scalability, or security. So as an example for high availability, automatically the service, when you select a highly available environment, let's assume you have an administrator, right? They want to create an environment. When they choose highly available, then the service itself is going to deploy all the instances across multiple availability zones. It's going to create all the underlying runtime databases that's, that's needed. It's going to create all the caching mechanisms. It's going to manage also all the locking internally. So all you don't need to be a, an expert in the middle to be able to configure such a topology. You just select the number of instances that you want across such a number of availability zones, and then the deployment is going to happen automatically. Last but not least, important component of a cloud native service is the native integrations. Because it's a native service, that means you have native integrations to the rest of the AWS ecosystem. 
And that's pretty powerful, because if you already have some processes or some operations in place for other services, then you can leverage the same ones for the AWS mainframe monetization service. For example, if you already have uh, CloudWatch that's being used for monitoring some of the other applications that may be running in the AWS cloud, then you can also use it with the same allotting mechanisms, with the same operations for the AWS mainframe monetization service. The same philosophy applies to centralizing the logs. So you can use CloudWatch logs. If you have to deal with uh, the security configuration, then you're going to be able to leverage IAM and AWS Cognito as well. From a procurement and billing perspective, then you can leverage uh, cost, and usage, uh, cost and usage management from uh, AWS billing as well. So all this is, is all natively integrated so that you can more quickly actually adopt some of the other AWS services and make sure you benefit from the entire ecosystem. So let's look at what the short-term architecture looks like. You remember the two phases I was mentioning. The initial phase is a migration and monetization, and the second phase is actually further monetization once you're on the AWS cloud. So in the short term, this is a typical architecture that, that you would obtain. So you can see uh, at the top, you have the AWS mainframe monetization components. So you can see the, the analyzer, the modern integrated development environment. You can do all the peel, all the tests, and the cloud-native runtime. So it's, as I was saying before, it's not only a quick migration, but it's also a modernization in many areas. You can see the CI CD pipeline on, on the left-hand side. Um, as I was mentioning before as well, all the data can be deployed on the uh, managed data source, Aurora, um, RDS, and or it can be a managed file system as well. On the right-hand side, because you've been deploying uh, on that uh, AWS ecosystem, then you can quickly create some innovations to be able to benefit even more from the AWS cloud. And at the bottom, you can see central services that are being used for system management. Now, the reason why I want to showcase this uh, short-term architecture is because right out of the gate, from the first phase in that overall monetization journey, you get all those agility benefits. And that's the best part of this architecture. So, that agility actually applies to all the business functions that are part of the workload that has been migrated to AWS. And it provides all that uh, agility, all that business value in the short term using a tool-based approach that minimizes the risk. If you start from the left-hand side, you can see you have knowledge-based development. Basically, you have an analyzer that's going to allow you to see all the dependencies across all your programs so that if you have to make an application change, you can quickly identify the impact of that application change and be reassured that that application change is not going to be disruptive and you can make it safely. You have an integrated development environment. So you have smart editing. You can do local unit testing. You can do quick builds. So it makes the development much more efficient. We already talked about the CI CD pipeline so that you can develop and promote your uh, application code changes quicker. By virtue of using the AWS mainframe monetization service, you're also going to have on demand and disposable server so that within minutes, you can have an up environment up and running. With that ser service as well, you have elasticity. Depending on, your, on the load of your application, the application will be able to scale out or scale back in so that you're only paying for what you need and so that you, you actually can scale, you can scale quicker with that infrastructure. You have choice of compute, data store, and language. What this means is that if you need to do a quick change, for example, let's assume you want to have more network bandwidth or you need no, more memory as part of your instances, well, you can quickly change the instance type of your environment, do a quick restart, and then that new instance type is available within minutes. When you deploy on the AWS mainframe position service, very quickly as well, you can service enable your applications, make them uh, API enabled, so that then other functionalities, other services can quickly access them. And by virtue of being on the uh, AWS cloud, then you can leverage the innovation platform, uh, which means that you can start using a API Gateway if you want to expose your functionality to the outside world. Um, if you want to actually create a mobile interface, then you can actually use uh, the uh, mobile services that are available with, with AWS. Uh, you can create microservices. You can do some data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, AWS Marketplace. So there are a lot of partner offerings that are available on AWS Marketplace that you can quickly integrate as well. The data has been moved to a uh, more modern uh, data store. And so by virtue of doing this, then you have broad data store access. And we know that sometimes having access to the data store on the mainframe can be uh, challenging. And so here, we're making it easier because uh, on the modern data stores, and you can easily access it for a lot of different use cases. 
pay-as-you-go is uh, oftentimes uh, a great benefit for our customers. It provides you with consumption-based pricing. And the great value of pay-as-you-go is that um, it lowers the cost, cost of entry so that it's easier to experiment. So you can easily start a new service, test out some new functionality, and make sure you, you can actually experiment and get some, some value from it. Pervasive automation. You have infrastructure as code. We mentioned cloud formation templates that you can, you can use. Centralized operations, that allows you to actually get some agility benefit as well, because if you centralize your operations, you're able to reuse your, the best practices in terms of opening the cloud. And last but certainly not least, cloud native fully managed services. That's all what I was talking to you about, the, the native services. That allows you to really focus on the application as opposed to managing the underlying infrastructure. So in summary, you get plenty of agility gains for the mainframe workloads, and all these, those agility gains are obtained in the short term using the AWS mainframeization service. All right, so something exciting I wanted to share with you today as well is that we have a new capability that's coming to the AWS mainframeization service around data integration and modernization. We know that data is, uh, is important as part of the uh, modernization journey for our customers. And so uh, we keep innovating, we keep listening, and we are very glad to announce a new solution. It's a precisely data replication for AWS mainframeization. And so essentially, that solution provides you with change data capture capability. It provides you with uh, real-time data replication so that you can replicate data on mainframe data stores, such as relational databases, such as hierarchical databases or index data sets, and move that data over to uh, AWS data stores. And that can be used for a lot of different use cases, whether you want to use it for data analytics, whether you want to create new channels, uh, whether you want to actually offload some processing from your mainframe to, to AWS. Data replication is also useful in the case of a large mainframe migration, and you need to build a transitional architecture. You may have a database that's on the mainframe side that needs to be synchronized to the uh, AWS side, and so you can use that type of data replication capability for that purpose. It can also be used as part of data pipelines. So it's a new capability that we're introducing. It complements nicely the strong capabilities that we have for application migration and modernization. All right, so um, to wrap up, I want to show to you uh, some more uh, events and activities that we have uh, during reInvent. We're fortunate to have a, a good number of mainframe sessions, so don't hesitate to attend those. Uh, one that I would like to highlight is the uh, ENT318 workshop. It's actually a hands-on lab for you to try by yourself an end-to-end -end migration with a simple application using the uh, MicroFocus uh, technology that's part of the AWS mainframe modernization service. So you'll be able to experiment uh, by yourself how to use that, uh, that service and see the end-to-end -end migration process. At the bottom, you can see some reference content as well. Uh, good documentation, uh, also some links to some demos, blog posts, or some tutorials. All right, so um, as you can see, the replatforming approach with MicroFocus and AWS mainframeization service delivers value both in the short term and in the long term. If you have some mainframe initiatives, feel free to engage with us. We're always glad to help. I want to thank you again, uh, Neil Fowler and Neil Data, for sharing your experience and your insights. And uh, thank you all for joining our session today, and have a great day.